So I'd like to begin by telling you a story. There was once a new college student who didn't wear shoes. And he lived right here. Um, and he's trying to get here. It's a true story. Um, but in his way, there was this tree, and it was dropping pine cones. And the pine cones, they fell primarily right around the base of the tree, but a little bit further out from the tree, and uh, less and less. As a math AOC, so um, being mathematically minded, he thought, oh, I can describe this density pretty much like a Gaussian distribution. So it looks like this rho with respect to r, sort of like that. And my question is, what path should I take around these pine cones that will both minimize the distance I have to go on? Because I could, you know, I could just go all the way up here. Um, but that's really far, so I could just go right across. Oh, but then I'm stepping on all these pine cones. So where is the um, optimal distance, or the path you can take um, to get around these pine cones? So um, uh, this problem and problems like this, uh, where you want to find the optimal path, uh, are the problems of um, calculus of variations. So in calculus of variations, um, I'll ask you to consider uh, a function f, which depends on your position and your velocity. And um, the game is we wish to choose um, a path like this, which will um, minimize some cost function, um, the total cost, which I'll write j as the integral over f um, in our path parameterized by t, so which will minimize the total cost. So um, I forgot to say here, like in particular in this problem, our cost cost is like distance plus um, some relative cost, and this depends on your preference or how tough your feet are. Um, it's the relative cost times pine cones. Um, so the way that we want to approach this problem is we have an endpoint, x1, and some path to another endpoint, x2, and um, we're going to uh, imagine that this is the shortest path, we're just going to sort of assume that uh, this is x of t, and then we're going to vary our path slightly by some other function, eta, um, and we're going to define define x of t and alpha to be x of t, so the unvaried path, plus alpha times eta of t. So um, you can see that if this alpha is zero, if you return the path, that, uh, you recover the original path you took, and if you vary alpha, you sort of vary this path up and down. And it doesn't have to look like this, it can be any wacky function or just a little thing. Um, so we're going to make this argument that this total cost, j, is minimized when, um, when alpha equals 0. Right? So that's when we don't have any variation of the path. j is this integral, so we'll write it like this, partial with respect to alpha of the integral. This integral goes from uh, the endpoints x1 to x2 of f with respect to t. And because we're integrating with respect to t, differentiating with respect to alpha, we're going to say that we can switch these partial with respect to alpha um, of f. And what is this f a function of? And we said here that it's our position and our um, derivative of our position with respect to time. So now we are going to chain rule this. So this becomes this integral. Um, so, how does f change with respect to x <coughs> times how does f, x change with respect to alpha plus how does f change with respect to x prime and how does x prime change with respect to alpha? And it's a vector, so we'll index these and uh, sum over them. All right. 
so now let's look at some of these terms and see what they are, particularly this one and this one. Um, this is the derivative of this path x with respect to alpha. So we see we've got an alpha here, so that goes away. And we just get that this thing is eta t, and actually eta i, because this is like component wise, or we can write that as vectors in f. Um, and then this one is the derivative of x prime with respect to alpha, so we got to figure out what that is. So x prime of t and alpha is just x prime what i is on x prime of t plus alpha eta prime of t. And once again, the derivative with respect to alpha, there's only alpha there, so that's just eta prime. Eta prime of t, i. All right, so let me rewrite this. Sum over um, partial f x i eta i plus partial f partial x i prime eta prime i t. So now um, let's just take this term and we'll sort of lose the summation for now. We'll put it back later and just consider this integral of partial um, f with respect to x i prime alpha prime i. And we want to integrate this by parts. So we'll call this our u, this our dv. Sorry about that. Uh, so we got our u, um, and then v is just eta, evaluated from x1 to x2, minus integral um, of, uh, I guess, eta, and then the derivative of u with respect to t, um, partial f x prime i, or x i prime t, what can we do now? Well, I didn't write it, but I forgot to. We have a condition here that eta um, at the endpoints must vanish. Um, otherwise, you can imagine you, know, you end up somewhere besides the endpoints, it's not what we want. So we um, enforce that condition, and that goes away. So now let's take this and pop it back in here, the integral. So we get that this goes um, to be the integral of the sum. Um, we've got an eta i here. We've got an eta i here. So I'm going to pull those out, eta i. Um, then we've got partial f with respect to x i, just x i. And then minus, we pulled out that eta i already. And then we've got the rest of this d dt partial f partial xi prime dt on the outside of everything. Um, and these limits of integration, um, and just a So we've now figured out that we have this equation, and what is that equal to? Following all the way back, that should equal zero. So for this thing to be identically, um, well, sorry, for this thing to evaluate to zero, we note that this is still an arbitrary function. So suppose that this is not identically zero. If this is ever um, if this is ever anything but zero, we'll just pick an eta that will amplify that and you know, like a delta function right there, this would be not zero. So this has to be zero. It's kind of a subtle argument, I think it's neat. Um, but anyhow, it's identically zero. Um, so we get this relation, and this is called Euler's equation. One of the many Euler equations. Um, so, so this is a PDE on functions, and um, looks pretty intractable. And then you realize, oh, wait, I'm trying to actually substitute, pick an f for my problem, and minimize with respect to that f. So um, let's do an example. Um, it's pretty much the simplest one you can do. We're going to minimize arc length. So um, the problem goes, I'm going to take two points, x1 and x2, and I wonder what path is the shortest connecting these. Does anyone have any guesses? Okay. Let's say a straight line. Let's say after class. <laughs> All right, yes, it is a straight line, but have you ever shown that? 
Um, well, we have the s is equal to the integral over ds. And what's ds? Well, we'll just do it in Cartesian coordinates. So that's um, dx squared plus dy squared in half. Um, and now let's put a dt over dt on the outside, hold it dt on the bottom and pick up a square. Voila. This thing, just as you might expect, is x prime squared plus y prime squared one half dt. Um, now for the sake of my talk, I'm going to just throw away that because in this case it's the same to minimize the square of the arc plane. Um, but we're going to actually look at this problem. It works out the same either way, but this will be more clear. Um, so we're going to take this to be our f. Just like over here, we have integral over f equals the total cost. In this case, the total cost is arc length, and we want to minimize it. So all we're going to do is plug this in here. We've got to take some derivatives of it. So the derivative of f with respect to x, well, it doesn't have an x in it, so it's 0. Um, and the derivative of f with respect to x prime is just 2x prime. Um, so we have 0 minus the der time der uh, ddt of this. So d dt of um, 2x prime equals 0. Uh, so x prime must be constant t. And similarly, y prime, or you can do this in arbitrary dimensions, but whatever. So this implies that it is indeed linear. So that's how we use that. And now we're going to do a similar problem. We're going to actually return to this pine cone problem now. But um, I'll hold on. So in the pine cone problem, we said that our cost is like distance plus um, some parameter beta as pine cones. Well, um, we now know that we'll, we're going to call the cost f. So we'll say f is equal to distance, it's just the ds, um, plus beta pine cones. So that's like the density. We're assuming it's Gaussian, which seems pretty reasonable. So we'll say e to the minus r squared what's the density without something you multiply by ds. So um, this is the cost function we're going to be using. So we'll pull out the ds. And um, now you can see that j is equal to the integral of 1 plus e to the minus r squared. Um, and ds, well, actually, I'll show you the way I actually did the problem. Um, because we have an r, I'm going to do it in polar coordinates, and the ds in polar coordinates is dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. And once again, I pick up the t squared. Oh, to the one half. That trick doesn't work here. It doesn't come out the same. So now this whole thing is our f, by definition. And uh, this gets uh, kind of hairy, and I don't want to do the of all of you, and I'm not even going to write down the solution exactly, but I'll say that this gives a complicated uh, second order uh, ODE. Well, actually, it gives two of them one for theta and one for r. Um, so, let me get over here. So, in order to solve this, we can treat it two ways to get the curve. Um, I need my chalk. Really? What do I do? Sorry. Um, okay, so we can either treat this as a um, boundary value problem, or we can treat it as an initial value problem. So, which one do you think is going to actually give us what we want? Since we knew where we want to end up, we're going to actually be more interested in the boundary value problem. But I'll show you both, and I'll tell you why. So say this is where we end up, and uh, we're going to go over here. And, uh, there's the trait, somewhere in the middle. Um, so before we do this, let me just write down 
what our f is. f is equal to 1 plus beta e to the minus r squared uh, ds. So what is, what is this beta here? Um, I think of beta as the uh, baby parameter because it says how much of a baby you are about stepping on that. <laughs> so you can see that um, if beta is zero, this problem reduces to the problem we just did, where you're just minimizing arc length. Um, and if beta is bigger, that means you're assigning more relative weight to pine cones and stepping on them. But you don't want to do that. So for um, beta little, it's going to kind of hug the tree, because it means you care more about not walking. So it's going to look like that. And as beta increases, this curve sort of goes out like that. Now, um, it's interesting uh, to look also, oh, so, so I should say, this is, uh, this is the answer to the problem of the talk, so it looks like I'm done, but uh, I can all go now. <laughs> um, no, because uh, look at what happens if you do the uh, initial value problem. Well, if I can get this right, well, bear with me. So um, for small beta, sort of hugs the tree like that and goes and curves back. Interesting. And here's slightly increasing beta. When you say initial value problem, yeah. what are your initial values? So a boundary value problem, we're looking at uh, x1 um, and x. We're giving it x1 and x2. But um, in, x, in the initial value problem, we just tell it it's our initial position in our initial uh, velocity, so the derivative of our initial position, the derivative of the first. So that's what this is here. I forgot to write that. There's the derivative. So where do you start out walking? So this is like, you know, this is you walking from point A to point B, um, trying to minimize pine cones the whole way. Um, and this is sort of like, it describes a different kind of student walking around campus, and they just know where they are, which direction they're going, where the pine cones are. So. So they can play with the pine cones. Uh, different story. But we get this interesting um, effect where um, it sort of curves back out. And it's not immediately clear why that should happen. So that brings us to the next point of this talk, which is so it seems like I'm done, right? But um, what we've been doing is defining a cost function on our surface, which is R2, and then minimizing that. But what if we um, instead redefine uh, our notion of distance to include pine counts? Uh, and minimize that. So this is like the uh, geometric approach to the problem. Okay, so in order to talk about redefining the notion of distance, we should probably talk about what we actually have defined as a notion of distance. And that means we have to talk about the metric tensor. So the metric tensor um, is defined on surface, um, and it is uh, bilinear, um, meaning it takes in two vectors and spits out a scalar, just like you could old find the dot product. So this defines the inner product, the dot product, um, on your surface. Um, it has some other properties too, but this is the main one we care about. So let's look at how that works. The thing you should Remember, I'll just put here. Um, if you have two vectors, v and u, v, u with an angle theta between them, v dot u is, of course, the magnitude, u magnitude, cosine of the angle between. So this defines angle and distances and angles on our surface. Um, and the way it does that, let's look at what it does to a vector and how you treat it. Um, so, what example do we want to do here? Let's look at this example. Uh, take this vector, little vector, ds, which is just um, dx 
in dy. Yeah. We want to find uh, the dot product of this vector. So what ends up happening is that uh, <coughs> ds squared, the magnitude squared, um, is going to be g i j um, d, or mm, how do I want to do it? Well, I guess I'm going to say d s i d s i or j. Mm, this is an example, exactly the example I meant to do here, but this will work. It saves time. Um, so this looks um, in matrix multiplication like taking d x d y, popping it uh, or putting it up against the vector. G11, G12, G21, G22, and G. So this is the exact same behavior. Here we have an implicit summation. Um, so this is what it ends up doing. And uh, so an example would be um, Euclidean space. Um, um, Euclidean, uh, I guess we'll say R2. Um, with the Cartesian coordinates on it. So in particular, the metric tensor there just looks like the identity matrix. So you can imagine how um, d, uh, um, ds squared will just be um, rated out. And you know, it, that goes away, and then you have that times that, that times that. Just like you'd expect, you get you recover your line element. So, um, the reason I want to do that for you is because we're going to now redefine. Um, what is zero in the bottom left corner there in that matrix? Yeah, it's the identity matrix. Sorry. Thank you. Um, okay, what am I doing? Yeah, so another example could be like, um, what does this matrix do um, if G is equal to lambda, lambda on the diagonals? Um, well, then ds squared would be, um, you know, we just sort of, um, you know, we just repeat this process with lambdas. And you can see how we pick up a lambda, and then we go into each component. So we get lambda d x squared plus lambda d um, d y squared. And if I may, I'm going to call this d s bar because I'm going to factor this out: lambda d x squared plus d y squared, and I'm going to call this d s. So putting this on here. Putting this in here, or if you like, you can say lambda i, just put it out in front of our metric. So these, this is really includes all the information about the metric. Um, and that's what we're going to do in this problem. So in this case, if we remember, our cost function was equal to 1 plus, um, one plus uh, beta e to the minus r squared ds. Well, let's just define our metric as the cost function, the S bar. Okay, we'll square both sides. And in this example, we're going to get the S bar squared uh, is just equal to one plus beta e to the minus r squared, squared d s squared. So this is the thing that we multiply into the uh, matrix to get our new metric. And this is going to be the metric that we're going the way that we're going to define distance on this new surface that replaces the need to talk about pine cones because they're in this in the surface. Um, and this is this is called a conformal variation of the metric tensor. So I'll just sort of show you. This is pretty much what the surface looks like. Kind of like a bell. Um, and uh, so this is the surface defined by g equals um, 1 plus beta e to the minus r squared 
squared d plus squared, or sorry, um, yeah. Or that's just the Euclidean sort of one we're comfortable with. Um, okay, so what we've done here is pretty cool. Um, we have taken our problem, which was just minimizing some cost function, and now we're literally just going to minimize distance on this new surface that we've tailor-made for this problem. Um, in particular, what's happened is, um, you can imagine how this, the pine cones are sort of curving the surface, so if you look in here, this is where there's lots of pine cones sort of in this area, and that sort of made it puff out, and that's like the top of the surface where it's stretched out the most. Um, also, if you're wondering um, what happens when you vary beta to the surface, if beta goes to zero, the surface goes to flat, and as beta increases, it gets more pointy. Um, so what I'd like to show you is the way that we're going to precisely uh, talk about curvature. We're going to use a notion called Gauss, Gauss curvature. In the Gauss curvature of a surface, K, I will sort of loosely define now, as being the product of K1 and K2, which are um, principal curvatures. Um, which are like sort of the, the direction where it maximally curves and minimally curves. And uh, when I'm like, talking about first, you need to remember how we define the curvature of a parameterized curve. So take a curve like uh, this, sort of, and look at a couple points on it, like here and here, and fit snugly a little circle in there, a little circle up here. Not good. Better. Um, the curvature at this point is equal to 1 over the radius of the circle that fits there. Um, likewise here. Make that little r. So the curvature here is bigger, the curvature here is smaller. The curvature where it's nearly flat is practically 0. The curvature where it is flat is 0. So um, it's very natural. And uh, so if you take a vector at a point, and look, sort of project that down to the surface, that path right there, what's the curvature of that? And then spin the, path, the vector around. So to show you what I mean, um, let me give you some examples. Uh, so the first example is a sphere. So, And if we take a vector here, put it on uh, a point on the sphere, and we spin it around like a compass needle. We look for where that curvature under is maximized and minimized. Well, you can pretty clearly see that on a sphere, it doesn't matter which way you point, and the circle um, that would fit snugly underneath it is just the radius of the circle, circle r. So um, k1, the minimum, is um, 1 over r, and so is the maximum, well, 2. So k, gas curvature of the sphere, is just 1 over r squared. Um, so this is an example of a positively curved surface. An example of a zero curvature surface, uh, you might guess. Sorry. Um, a plane, for instance, has zero curvature, because no matter which way you orient that vector, it's never going to be over. Flat. Um, so that one's kind of obvious, but uh, one slightly less obvious is if you take a um, cylinder. So wide. Um, if you look here at this point, you can sort of imagine drawing this to minimize curvature, uh, or to maximize curvature first, going this way. If we draw here that the radius is r. Uh, this guy has a one maximum curvature is equal to one over r. But you can draw this one here, um, and that's got a zero curvature. So that the product of those is zero curvature. And then the last case um, is a uh, less than zero. So this would be something like a hyperboloid. And you can imagine uh, at a point like this right here, sort of 
cross section of that. Um, drawing a couple areas like this way and this way. And the circles that sit under these go like this and like this. Um, so they're both non-zero, but we have to choose an orientation. And if we choose it up, one of them will say it's negative. And if we choose it down, the other one's negative. So you can't win. Um, they're going to be opposite signs. So K1, K2 is going to be negative. Um, so these are some examples of different gas curvature and surfaces. It's pretty much what you'd expect. Um, now, let me see. So one other thing to talk about is what do parallel lines do on their surfaces? So if I take uh, on a sphere two lines that are parallel, um, or any positively curved surface, they will eventually converge over, over a ways. So on positively curved surfaces, these lines tend to converge. Here, they tend to stay parallel up to infinity. It's also true here. If you can imagine that, these two hel helix, whatever you call them, um, plural of helix of those, they will say parallel to. Um, and on the negatively curved surfaces, surprise, surprise, they diverge. Um, so the reason I'm talking about this is because we have this interesting effect here where we saw this diverging, these lines diverging. And the first time I did this, I thought that it was a problem in my numerical simulation where I approximated the solution to these ODEs. Um, but it turns out it's actually because we have negative curvature in this thing. So if we look at the curvature um, of this surface, I guess I've drawn an arrow, but the curvature of this surface, um, before I write down what, draw a graph of what it is, let me first say that this special kind of surface has a special formula for curvature. Um, it's like this. If this thing is uh, lambda, it's, um, Gaussian log. It looks like this. Um, so that's how I what I use to calculate the curvature of this surface. Um, you can imagine this gets kind of like a nasty calculation when you plug in this thing, but it's uh, readily doable, and it looks like this. Here's our, or I'm sorry, here's curvature with respect to the radius. So this is as we go out from here. It starts out positive, which makes sense because you can imagine fitting like a sphere at the top of this or down a little ways, you can imagine fitting another sphere. Um, so it's positively curved at first, then it drops off, not that severely, it drops off, and then comes back. So there's this little um, area here with negative curvature. Well, actually, it has negative curvature forever. It never comes back. It just approaches from the bottom. Um, but it's someplace around here where you can see that this really looks like this graph here. This is like the saddle point, it's got negative curvature. And it's here where your lines start to diverge. So some other insight that the geometry is able to give us. Um, also, the geodesics here that we drew previously can be understood to be distance minimizing here. So if I take a point here and a point on the other side here, um, just right, it'll sort of go around like that. That'd be like one of these things. And then, uh, oh, I never did figure out how to draw this clearly, but uh, if I take some initial point going out like that, you can sort of imagine if you were an ant crawling on this surface where you'd end up if you just keep going what seems straight to you. Um, and I, I don't know, something like that. It kind of curves around. And, but that's, that's what you end up seeing here um, with one of these curves. So um, it's got this nice interpretation of, uh, yeah, just like sort of fewer on the surface where it would you um, so cover that. Yeah. So um, does anyone have any questions at this point? Oh yes. Um, so then there's a point where your graph will intersect the x axis. Do you know what R value that is? So it looks kind this of graph? Thing. Yeah. Wait, wait, what do you mean the x axis? Curvature versus height graph. Oh, oh, this point here? Yeah, yeah actually, um, I, uh, yeah. So it's actually something seemingly natural. I think it's like one or um, plus or minus, I mean, 
Well, not regarding that. Um, one minus the product log function of e or something. And I'd never heard of that in one of Dr. Kakiyas. Apparently, it's something like Lambert function. Uh, do you know what it is? Or not the function, but if you look at the, the surface you draw in the pathic cross section, along yeah. the edges, there's like a deflection point. That's exactly, that's, that's, that's the better way to look at it. So like there is some expression, and it is apparently natural because there's a name for whatever it is. Um, but the better way to look at it is where there's actually an inflection point, because here we have like, you know, it must occur somewhere in here. That was a bad drawing, but yes, the inflection point is what you should be looking for. Um, does that answer your question? What is a geodesic? Okay, sorry. <laughs> so we sort of, thank you so much. Um, so we got into this section um, of the talk without defining a geodesic. So before we were just minimizing cost. Now we're minimizing distance. Things that minimize distance are what I mean by geodesics. So these things are geodesics. Um, this is a geodesic sort of globally. It completely minimizes the path. And this one is locally a geodesic because clearly to get from here to here, the shortest path would probably not be a go around, but it's locally minimized. So it's the things that minimize distance are geodesics. Thank you um, for reminding me to say that. Great. Looking good. So this time in the talk, we have been um, addressing this one problem um, of these pine cones falling from a tree, right? Um, and we have got all this stuff from the particular pine cone distribution, the particular density. Um, so I will write a piece of notation um, that this density sort of gave us all our other information, it gave us the curvature. Um, but what if we sort of play um, a new game? And the new game we're going to play is when we sort of equate these. We're going to write down a way that we can equate these. Um, in particular, I'm going to write down that the Gauss curvature times the metric, so this is another conformal variation of the metric, is equal to the density um, times like the identity matrix of this. Um, so what have I written down here? This is, I'm claiming that this is a natural relation to write down um, that, um, relates the curvature of our space to the pine cone density of our space. And I'm going to draw on an L G. K um, G I J equal to rho um, I. Um, compare this to Einstein's field equations. <laughs> Anyhow, Einstein's field equations go like this. Um, it's something called the Ricci curvature minus something called the Ricci curvature scalar times your metric. Um, writing mu nu, those are just indices that make these things on uh, matrices in a fixed coordinate basis. Uh, just like ij, is equal to some constant of proportionality times something else called the stress energy tensor. So why did I write this on the board? Well, it almost looks like that. <laughs> it almost looks like that. Thank you. Yeah. So this is something that tells you about curvature uh, and space at distance. And this is something that tells you about density. Um, likewise, this thing, which is called the Einstein answer, um, which, uh, if I may be permitted to write this, uh, the, the metric um, determines the Ricci curvature, and the Ricci curvature, which is just sort of a more sophisticated notion than the Gauss curvature that works better um, at telling us stuff about spaces that have more dimensions, um, that determines this. So this, so it's all determined by the metric. So I'm going to write this thing as a function of g, so to speak. 
Um, this Einstein tensor, this is just about curvature and space. And this thing is density. And now I'm kind of uh, hand-waving because this is actually stress and energy tensor. Uh, like, and this is some, here we're in two dimensions, and here we're in three plus one dimensions, which means three of space and one of time, so four dimensions. That's the easiest part of general relativity. Um, so this isn't strictly speaking density, but anyhow, we're, it's an analogy, okay? Um, and the reason I would like to say that this is an analogy, let me tell you a couple cases, and of course we're not time um, to give you a little piece of intuition. Um, so the trivial case, case of each, is when you have no pine cones, so zero on this side, um, and that would give rise to no curvature. That seems reasonable, that's like what we want. So this is set aside. Likewise, when you have no matter or energy, which are the same thing, um, this thing is zero. And this thing um, is zero too, uh, no curvature. And that is actually what happens when you plug into the Einstein tensor um, flat space, which is, this is a different eta. This is Minkowski space time. Um, and it's flat space in three plus one dimensions. Um, so they're both vacuously true uh, like that. And um, now oh, the other one I want to talk about is, um, what do I want to call this? I want to call this the uh, singularity. Singularity case. So what if we had um, our pine cone density with respect to R look like this? Did I draw a graph? I mean, it's a spike of the origin. So um, I'm going to write that as a delta function um, of zero. So this is um, close up of the origin. Well, I would argue that the shape that satisfies this would be a cone. Here is the point of infinite curvature. And I think that the geodesics on the cone will resemble a little bit the geodesics here. Um, what is the solution here when this, on this side, is a delta function of the origin? And I should point out here that this is a matrix, and I'm only talking here about the sort of uh, top left entry. Everything else is zero. This is the Schwarzschild solution, which is, of course, a black hole. My favorite thing. Um, so the geodesics, um, and the reason, so black holes might be kind of exotic, but in general relativity, um, whenever we want to do anything with a point um, around the mass, it's simplest to assume that mass is like point mass, and then we're using um, sort of a far field uh, approximation um, of a black hole, of a point mass at the origin, wherever it is. Um, so if we wanted to set up GPS satellites, for instance, and we wanted to account for the GR um, time dilation and stuff, uh, we would end up uh, using this. And orbits around this look like this, or they might be circular. Um, orbits around a cone, geodesics on a cone, kind of look like this. So um, if I were to draw this projected back into 2D, it'd maybe like that. So I'm saying that's an analogy. Um, of course, you'd never get this around a, a, a tree because uh, the best way to avoid sitting on pine cones is never to infinitely walk around a pine tree. Um, so that's where the analogy is. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so I think the last thing I want to say about this, um, this whole thing was sort of uh, a way to sneak this in. Uh, <laughs> 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 that's not what I meant. Um, I think that the, the uh, intuition I want you to take away from this analogy is that in general relativity, what we mean when we say mass curves space is just like that. And what we mean when we say that mass deflects orbits and that orbits are the shortest paths in space is like just how if you are looking at a field with a tree dropping much pine cones around it going out you know, like that, um, it's easier to walk around the tree. It's also easier um, to walk around a black hole and sort of skirt around it because uh, 
well, if you go into the middle of the metric close up and it gets all stretched out like this. In fact, it gets so stretched out that there's an event horizon. So that's a topic for another time. Um, uh, so, to wrap this up, our, our student learned that uh, in order to properly answer this problem about what's the best path around this tree, uh, you should really apply calculus of variation. But if you want to understand that, you need to look at the differential geometry of it. And it ends up looking an awful lot like general relativity. So, he decided that he'd just put on some shoes. <laughs> Yeah, um, I have Do Carmo differential geometry, and um, I also got a paper on um, low dimensional uh, different or general relativity, which I didn't understand very well. So uh, mainly Do Carmo. Uh, any other questions? What about your physics? What? Oh. Well, I just need that stuff. <laughs> no, that's um, previous research. I guess um, Meisner, Born, and Weaver Gravitation is where I learned most of this, um, which is the Bible of general relativity. Um, so that's a big book. Anyhow. So, yeah. Any questions? Okay. Alex, can I turn off your phone? Yeah, thank you.